So this is Bruce and Young's 1986 model of face recognition. It's a stage model, which means that the process involves certain stages. More often than not, they will be sequential, so stage one will have to ha happen before stage two, etc. So if we look at each individual stage, this is where we're going to begin with structural encoding. So as soon as the face is seen, the structural encoding area of the brain becomes activated. Face recognition has begun. It builds a very basic representation of the face and the mind by analysing the expression of each feature. So for example, if somebody's smiling, it's going to analyse that smiling mouth. This happens in the view centred descriptions area here. And at the same time, the individual features are being processed and they're being processed in the expression dependent descriptions. We now move on to here to so, So in this area, the rudimentary information from the basic first analysis is refined. So we're refi ref refining the information from the structural encoding. So first, there is a conclusion about the emotional state of the person being looked at. And this takes place in the expression analysis section. There is focus on the lips and what is being said. That's if anything is actually being said. So this is what we call facial speech analysis. Also, particular characteristics of the face are noticed. So, for example, is the person wearing glasses? So this is going on inside the directed visual processing area. So this is an important check for facial recognition. Now we're coming down here to stage three. What's happening here is that what we call the FIUs or the facial recognition units are working incredibly fast. They're comparing the incoming information to the familiar faces stored in this area of the memory system. So we have, somewhere in our brain, we have images of faces stored, or at least familiar faces stored. It works with structural similar similarities, such as shape of nose and so on and so forth. So do they have a particular shape of nose? Do they have a, you know, other particular features that stand out or that we can recognize and then match to what we already hold? In our, in our memory of familiar faces. The next step accesses biographical information. So these are the, the pins or the person identity nodes. So for example, you know, what job does this person have? What hobbies do they have? Um, is this person in my psychology class? Um, that man was in that film, or whatever. Finally, and extremely quickly, a name is generated. So, that man with short hair, um, you know, very, you know, quite a distinct nose. He was, he's an actor. Um, he was in the Mission Impossible films. Oh, it's Tom Cruise. Quite often, that last bit, that name generation, takes time and we suffer from what's, what's commonly known as a TOT uh, or the TOT syndrome, tip of the tongue, when we're saying, I know that person, I know that person, he was in that film, he was married to so-and-so. Um, and you know all this information about this person, but you can't quite get, get the name out 
fourth, fourth stage, and this isn't really the fourth stage because this is going on all the way through the process, but this is the cognitive system. Um, this is vast and complicated, but the, for, the, for the purpose of this model, it holds all the visual memories of faces and the environment they are usually seen in, which is why perhaps sometimes you see somebody out of context and you, and you don't recognize them as quickly. It automatically adds new information that the viewer pays attention to all the time. It contains the schemas, so those blueprints that are stored in our memory of the individual. All information is stored here, ready for retrieval. So, hey, we've recognized the face. Bruce and Young um, conducted investigations uh, into uh, soldiers who had been brain damaged. Um, and what they found was that there was evidence that face processing was what we call modular. In exactly the same way we looked at the memory system being a process of modules, for example, sensory memory, short-term memory, long-term memory, it appears that the face recognition system is also modular. And these soldiers... Um, had problems that were specific to one part of the system. So one part of the system may be damaged, but another one will stay intact. So maybe they could recognize somebody as familiar, but they didn't know where from. Or they could recognize somebody from their facial expression, not their entire face. There's also evidence, a uh, case study conducted into somebody known as Mr. W. Mr. W was a 54-year-old farmer with what we call a bilateral occipital lobe lesion. He couldn't recognise faces. He couldn't even recognise his own face. However, there were certain things he could do. He could match unfamiliar faces. He could also pick faces from other objects and animals. He could copy line drawings of faces. And I, he could identify the sex of faces correctly. That was without cues, without any prompting. He could accurately perceive facial expressions. And interestingly enough, he could identify his own sheep. So, what we're saying here is that the modular way in which face recognition takes place means that you can retain certain parts of the face recognition system and yet lose the function of other parts of the face, lose the function of other parts of the face recognition system. So this is another one. Uh, this is the Thatcher illusion, even though it's got Barack Obama on it. Um, most of you have seen this one before. You'll already be kind of identifying certain parts of Obama which don't look quite right. Um, but you'll also remember that the first time you did this, you didn't really see anything particularly unusual. Obviously, you know, the mouth and the eyes aren't looking quite right, but that seems to be kind of okay at the moment until we, of course, turn the other way up and they look surprisingly different. Uh, so basically what we've done is we've, we've removed the eyes and the mouth and we've turned them upside down. So again, this suggests that facial features are processed separately. So we see kind of faces and we don't really see them in, in, in as much detail as we seem to think we do. There are some good things and some bad things about this model. Certainly, probably the most negative part of this is, is certain parts of this system are quite vague. And in particular, um, the cognitive processing model part of it is quite vague. So if we say this is the cognitive processing model, the cognitive side of it, um, we don't seem to know that much about. We don't really know um, how it's accessed uh, and in what way it's accessed. So this isn't really explained particularly well. Uh, 
it doesn't explain familiarity without awareness, something called co covert recognition. We may kind of feel familiar with somebody, but we don't actually, we're not actually aware of certain, certain things about them. So, for example, WJ was able to identify faces with no sense of recognition. So we say, well, yes, that's a familiar face. Uh, but I, I, I don't know why that's a familiar face. Uh, Dehan also, case study, again, um, could name faces but had no information about them. Again, this should not be possible according to the model. So what's good about it? PET scans, brain scans, have shown different areas of the brain are accessed during the face recognition process, suggesting that it is modular. So PET scans are brain scans. And just like when we looked at the um, memory system, we know that certain parts of the brain are accessed when we are thinking about certain things from our past. So Young 1985, um, again, diary study, found no cases of recognition without prior knowledge. So everybody knew something about the faces they were trying to recognise. However, look at this, 22 participants. So you might like to evaluate that um, in terms of the sample size, whether you think that's significant or not. Um, that would be AO3 evaluation if you're looking at the participants.